This program was recorded in 1982. What were these men doing? They were making millions of dollars selling CIA terrorist equipment, expertise, and actually training uh, Libyans, selling this equipment to Libya, and actually training terrorists in the Libyan China Lake terrorist training camp. Now, as the story is, is being squeezed out in bits and pieces, it's coming out, it's now been documented that there were active duty special forces officers uh, helping them to train terrorists inside Libya. Now we're talking about up until 78, 79. And there were also CIA active duty personnel at China Lake training terrorists. And uh, it, this even boggles my mind, having been inside and, and from what I've seen. But all of the, all of the to do we're making about terrorism, and here we are, Deliver, here our CIA is delivering technology and actually training Libyan terrorists. Another fascinating evening with former CIA official John Stockwell, tonight on Alternative Views. Back in 1981, we did a program with John Stockwell called CIA Update. Well, it's no longer all that current, but, well, maybe it is. There are a lot of things that we talked about in that program that you still would be fascinated by. So we're going to see that again and present a new CIA story from 1986. John Stockwell is one of our good friends and a firm fixture on alternative views. I'm sure you know John by now. He was a former CIA high official for 12 years, quit the CIA and wrote a very famous, informative book, In Search of Enemies. Well, he's a full-time writer now, and he is on his novel writing experience, and one is just coming out. John, what's the name of it, and what's it about? Well, my second book is Red Sunset. It's uh a story about some American oil company people in a small African capital, about the woman principally, and the, the adventures she gets into, which includes a chess match, a love story, a uh, terrorist kidnap attempt, uh, which is the vehicle. But really the purpose of writing the book was to try to discuss what it's like our enemies, our detractors, accuse us of being imperialists and being involved in neocolonialism. And it's always fascinated me because I've lived the life that they call neo-colonialist uh, in, the, in the big villa in a newly independent country with several servants and shiny new cars and jet planes here and there, while most of the people in the country uh, have very little uh, to survive, to live off of. And so this is the story. I, I wanted to write a story about ordinary Americans who live that kind of a life and what, what the life is all about and how it affects the people around them as well as themselves. And where does it take place? What are the actual scenes and characters and actions? I set it in Burundi, and I chose Burundi because it's um, in very... Africa. In Africa. Burundi is in... I chose it because it's exactly in the center of Africa. It's, it's as, as close to, to nowhere, so, so to speak, as you can get. It's also a very pretty place. It's right on the Western Rift Valley, right at the northern tip of Lake Tanganyika. And you have the Mitumba Mountains and the Virunga Volcanoes and the Lake Tanganyika. And the city is actually up overlooking the lake. So it's a gorgeous little place and, and as I say, quite remote. Well, you grew up in... Africa. Well, I grew up in Zaire, which is right across the, on the other side of the lake. And then I served in Zaire with the CIA. These Mitumba Mountains that I write about in this book were a haven of rebels when I was in Zaire, but I also served in Burundi at one time. So we had problems with... Uh, we, the, the mountains were sort of an intelligence target. So we were covering them. I was sending people into the mountains, and I became fascinated with them. In fact, there were no viable rebels there. There was a great exaggeration of the rebel threat because that's a good way to keep the United States and its aid interested in, in supporting your country. 
and uh, I try to bring this out, there was a kidnapped uh, uh, threat that was brought to us from people across the lake who came into Burundi and said that they had information of a plot to kidnap the American ambassador. And this, of course, stirred us up no end, as you can imagine, flash cables to Washington and on a full-time alert and every security measure we could take. It turned out it was just a con. There was just some guys who wanted to squeeze a little money, a couple hundred dollars out of us. Uh, but then I was there in, in 70, 71 about when I left. But uh, in 75, these same people did kidnap four European scholars working with a, a Caltech uh, grant who were studying fish or something on the lake. And they did kidnap them and take them into the mountains. And so naturally writing a, a novel about that area, I wanted to incorporate how, you know, how a kidnap plot could work and what kind of people would do it and how it would affect the people in, in the city itself. Do you, you mostly focus on the African political situation or the sort of machinations between America and the Soviet Union behind the scenes, or did both of these themes come out? Those, those themes are in the background. I wanted to focus on the life of an American woman who finds herself in such a place. And uh, there is a Soviet diplomat involved. There is a, she plays a, a big chess match against the local chess master, who's a South African banker. And some of their friends are British. Uh, and the Africans are in the background. They're subplot, sort of, uh, in the background, which some of the reviewers have said is, uh, in a way, an ironic way, the strongest part of the book is the Africans in the background. But uh, I really wanted the story to be about this young woman. So not about politics or diplomacy so much as just her life. So there's an element of the love story in that as well as a political novel. You're trying to combine these themes. It started it. out to be more of a political intrigue novel, adventure intrigue uh, in real life politics. And uh, what happened was the love story took over the book. It was a subplot originally, and then it, the, by the time I got the, the manuscript to New York and sold it, the editors wanted me to focus on the woman and the love story. And essentially, they, they persuaded me. And so the, it, it is primarily a love story, yes. Well, John, you've been prohibited by the courts now to say anything or write anything about the CIA and its operations. No, is no, this, that's not exactly not correct. Exactly right. No. I can say all kinds of things about the CIA, but I have to submit it to them for censorship first. So I assure you, I could write a 100,000-page book about the CIA and as long as it was favorable, they wouldn't censor a word. <laughs> but you can speak, though. Well, impromptu speaking is covered, particularly if it's about the subject of my previous book or what I've lectured before. They, they admitted that it would be very difficult to try to enforce an injunction against uh, interviews and, and speeches. But if I had written notes for, say, this interview, uh, I would have to submit those notes for censorship. Well, we as long as it's impromptu, though, I'm supposed to be okay. Well, we have a lot of things here loaded up about the CIA, the uh, stories and information that we've been gathering, waiting for your next trip over to Alternative Views. Fortunately, I haven't more. seen their notes that they're going to be working from, so, <laughs> and they're not under injunctions. They don't have to be censored. <laughs> okay, Doug, you have probably the most important one there. Don't you? Well, John, to start off, let's look at the CIA under the Reagan administration. What are some of the most significant occurrences vis-a-vis -vis the CIA under Reagan? What has he done in his terms of his policies that have affected the CIA? Well, the, the Reagan election, when he came into office, uh, there was great joy and dancing in the halls of the CIA. They recognized that they would be set back into full-fledged uh, full uh, activities, uh, much like they were at the height of their powers in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and, and that euphoria has pretty much continued. Uh, I, I have not been inside the building, obviously, but I have had a couple of conversations with people uh, who were, and uh, without telling me anything of any substance, they did. Their voices were, were, were crowing and, and gloating about uh, how the, the world was being righted in their mind, and they were out there defending uh, national security and freedom in all kinds of places, as the CIA has done in 
Chile and Angola and Nicaragua and elsewhere for so many years. They announced on October the 1st that they're going to literally double the size of their new headquarters, the CIA, which would indicate that they're obviously planning many more activities and an expansion of their entire operations. What is some of the evidence of an expanded CIA under Reagan? Well, of course, uh, you, you know, I, 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 I was kidding. I was up in Washington recently, and I was getting so many invitations uh, to go and lecture that I was, uh, I was kidding and saying that I had something that would go on forever because I'm the last whistleblower, because they've got the court orders and injunctions and the uh, the Supreme Court rulings, and now the names of agents bill going through, and there won't be, all of which is to say that we probably will never know for sure what they're doing now under Reagan, because they are succeeding in getting in a de facto official secrets acts. So the, the American public and the victims will never know the true stories of the current activities like the war in Angola, the pre-Vietnam CIA covert action, the Chile coup, the assassinations, they will be muzzled probably forever, so we won't know for sure. What you hear about uh, are the occasional, it, you know, it's an organization that will always go around shooting itself in the foot because it deals with activists who are trained to, to break the law, who have activist instincts, and they will always be getting themselves in trouble. And what we're really seeing now are gross blunders and gross missteps, and in one case where two agents went so far afoul of propriety in the law that it did erupt into the public view. That's Turple and Wilson, who Turple were covered on 60 Minutes and a PBS documentary. What is Those it? are the ones who helped, were helping Libya, right? Incredible, if, if you can believe it. At ex I, the w look at the way our president is dealing with the Libyan problem and Gaddafi, our country, so concerned uh, with the terrorism. Uh, the hitman team that was supposed to be tracking our president down to kill him. And now we find that two fairly senior CIA officers were out actually training. They had, re they had resigned from the CIA, but they were being supported by people who were at the very top of the CIA. Who, who it's not clear, and of course <laughs> it may never come clear exactly to what degree they were being supported, but they were being met, debriefed, and assisted in some ways by people like Ted Shackley, who, who was a, a top CIA, he was chief of the Latin America Division, chief of the Far East Division, and then assistant deputy director of operations. Now, what were these men doing? They were making millions of dollars selling CIA terrorist equipment, expertise and actually training uh, Libyan, selling this equipment to Libya and actually training terrorists in the Libyan China Lake terrorist training camp. Now as the story is, is being squeezed out in bits and pieces, it's coming out, it's now been documented that there were active duty special forces officers uh, helping them to train terrorists inside Libya. Now we're talking about up until 78, 79. And there were also CIA active duty personnel at China Lake training terrorists. And uh, it, this even boggles my mind, having been inside and, and from what I've seen. But all of the, all of the to-do we're making about terrorism, and here we are, deliver, here our CIA is, delivering technology and actually training Libyan terrorists. This sort of uh, illustrates your thesis in uh, of Search for Enemies that the function of the CIA is to cause problems. That makes it possible for military intervention. So that would fit into this sort of scenario that you've drawn. Indeed, and there's no other real explanation for it. Now, one, one of the CIA officers who was still in the CIA, uh, he denied at first association with them. They were claiming that he had supported them. He denied it. And uh, then when, it, when, it was, uh, when he had to admit or perjure himself, he had to admit that there was association uh, he, he claimed that it was only to keep contact so they could tell him what the terror, who the terrorists were and what they were doing. Therefore, it was a legit, legitimate CIA enterprise. But then when the, when the Senate tried to squeeze out and the Justice Department documentation from the CIA, there was none. And he said that was because it was something that he was keeping in his vest pocket. So either we have a full-fledged CIA operation or we have an illegal 
venal corrupt operation. But either way, there was complicity with these people who were training and, and making the Libyan terrorists a great deal more, more effective. Now, mind you, we're talking about millions of dollars. We're talking about the, the latest in terrorist, uh, you know, explosive devices and, and the way you can make an ashtray into an explosive device so when a bad guy puts out his, or a good guy for that matter, puts out his cigar, it blows up and kills everyone in the room, you know, this sort of thing. Well, isn't there, th this seems even more incredible from a couple points of view. One is the fact that maybe it's a super Machiavellian thing that the CIA and the FBI need to have terrorists in the world to justify their increased uh, um, money for appropriations. For instance, when uh, the CIA made their latest report, they indicated that there were 3,336 terrorist attacks during the previous year. Now, Alexander Haig didn't think that was enough, so he sent the report back to the CIA, said, give me more terrorist attacks, so they, they upped it to uh, almost 6,000. Uh, this, yeah, then, uh, then the other aspect of this, is that the CIA has historically had a close relationship with the Israeli secret police, the Mossad. And yet the Mossad and the uh, Libyan government and their secret police were mortal enemies, supposedly. So what's going on here? Well, on the one hand, the CIA purist would argue that we have an intelligence requirement to provide information to our government about terrorists and terrorist organizations about the world. And therefore, the only way you can get this information is to penetrate terrorist organizations, get your people inside so they can tell you what's being done. The other side of that is, is very much in the direct... And, and on the first argument, you would, you would try to have contact with Mossad and with the Libyans and with the PLO and with the Red Brigade, anyone you could. And the KGB. And the KGB yeah. uh, to, to gather information about them. That's the purest, purest argument. But how can you explain this provision of, of, of shiploads of terrorist equipment to the Libyans and training by active duty special forces and active duty CIA officers? Now that's, that's where it gets so Machiavellian. It, it blows your mind. And there's no way you can justify delivering the equipment to them in order to gather information about who they are. That's not necessary to gather intelligence. And the only answer is that a little bit of both, that you have an organization that functions in a troubled world. It gets more money and more opportunity. As, like you say, Hague wants 6,000 terrorist bombings last year, not 3,000, because it's more dramatic and he can get more mileage out of it. The CIA, by the same token, would like to have a, a more troubled world because they're, they have more to do. The president and the Congress and the press and everybody are, are relying on them and giving them their carte blanche more in a troubled world than in a peaceful world. Uh, but then the other thing that has raised its head, not the first time, but, but so ominously in this Wilson Turple thing, is, is individuals doing it for gain, for millions of bucks. Let's face it, someone in the CIA who's commanded wars around the world uh, has sent people off to die, which, you know, which is the ultimate ego trip for a Pentagon type of person, is the ultimate power that a human being can have is to send other humans off to die not sentence one individual to the gas chamber, but send 5,000 off to die. Well, take someone who's been at the top of the CIA, and he's been doing this secretly and, and uh, commanding forces in the world, manipulating governments, and then he hits a certain age of maybe 50 or possibly 60 if he goes the whole route, and then he retires on 20,000 a year. And it just, you know, it just isn't comfortable. It doesn't work. Now, some of these people have managed to, to retire comfortably, like Bill Colby, the for, former director, and uh, Dick Helms, the former director, by becoming agents of foreign governments and so declaring themselves to our, our Justice Department and getting a salary from the Iranian government or the Japanese government or elsewhere. And people down the line have done the same sort of thing. Vernon Walters is now doing Vernon that, Walters. getting hundreds of thousands of dollars consulting for Guatemala, Argentina, Chile, etc. Yeah, and Vernon Walters was who? the deputy director of the CIA. When I was in, he was the deputy director over me. I and was, was Nixon's uh, White House man, too. Yeah. Um, so selling themselves as agents of foreign governments to sell their expertise and contacts that they gathered in their CIA careers. And then you have these guys, it's now surfaced, and it's, it's an obvious, uh, it's a documented fact, have been selling 
uh, technology, terrorist technology, to the Libyan government. Meanwhile, our government is not moving against the Vernon Walters or the Dick Helmses or the Bill Colbys, uh, who, who have become agents of foreign governments, but they're suing John Stockwell for writing a book to the American people to tell the truth about what's going on. And they're trying to pass a bill that would make it illegal for any publication to publish the names of any CIA agents. How does this constitute but, a threat to freedom of the press? But mind you, this yeah. bill is it's justified on the basis of the revelation of names. But the bill goes far, far beyond names. It, it says names of secret agents or the activities of secret agents that could draw attention to them. Now, this means, for example, let's take some things that the CIA has done. A uh, secret agent kicks in your door and rapes your wife. Now, if you went out and wrote an article about that and published it in the paper, both you and the editors of the paper, even if you didn't name him, you just said, Mr. X, working for the CIA, kicked in my door last night and raped my wife, that would be a felony under this law. Now, in the debate in Congress on this law, some of the critics, and there are some, fortunately, but not enough, said, wait a minute, the way, this thing, the way I read this proposed bill if the London Times published an article about a CIA escapade somewhere, uh, the New York Times could not reprint the London Times article without committing a felony. And the sponsors of the bill stood up and roared, that is right, we want to stop all of this uh, talk about the CIA. So what we have here, by the sponsor's own admission, is an official secrets act. And a, and a very strict one, one that will cover anything they want to cover up. They classify it and claim it has to do with secret agents' activities. My book could never be published. The, the CBS and PBS uh, stories that you mentioned on, on Turpel and Wilson could not be published. It would be a felony. Many of the 60-minute shows would be felonies. So this provides a cover of secrecy for the CIA of the broadest possible sort. For the first time in our history, freedom of speech has been, uh, is being, now it hasn't passed yet, although the nose count is that it will go sliding right through Congress right now, but for the first time in our history, the secret police of the government are being gi given legal precedent over freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Now, mind you, they've bludgeoned people before and punished people before, such as myself and Frank Snepp and, and Phil Agee and Marchetti for, for attacking, for criticizing the, the CIA. But they've done that in the civil court, but now it will be a felony to, to criticize the CIA, to complain about its activities, to expose its corruption. And, and the record is clear. We're talking about an organization that has been responsible for 300,000 deaths by their own records, by the, the Senate's own records, 300,000 deaths in the, in the third world. Uh, and that's, that's a modest figure. I gave that figure myself in Senate testimony, and the next morning, Cy Hirsch, uh, I was playing tennis with him, and he, he, he said, Stockwell, you're all wet. He said, the figure's over 500,000. You forgot Indonesia. Mm. Now, that's what they've been doing out in the world. And of course, in the mood of these times, there are a lot of Americans who, who would just as soon melt Africa or Asia or wherever. They really could care less. But they have been doing things in the United States that you would, you know, strange lovey kind of things that you would only accredit to the Gestapo or the KGB at their worst. The mind uh, drug control The mind MK Ultra, extensive over years experimenting with unwitting Americans by, by dropping them LSD and then filming their activities under the influence of drugs they didn't know they had received. As well as infiltrating political groups and spying on Americans which were against the CIA charter. It was not supposed to be oh, domestically clearly. involved. And Carter put some guidelines regulating domestic activity of the CIA and Reagan has signed an executive order putting these aside. Putting these aside. In effect, unleashing the CIA domestically Un so that any political group can be, or any individual could be the yeah. target of a CIA operation. So this is uh, another threat to our civil liberties here in the country. For sure, and they're defining who the targets are. They don't have to even go to a judge and say, we think this person's a target. They decide who a target is. And secrecy, as I've said before, and, and uh, many other people have said, including some, some 
leading senators, secrecy is primarily designed to cover up their misdeeds. Only in, in the very rare, most internal sensitive cases is secrecy a matter of national security. Yes, diplomacy at a certain point, you need some secrecy to negotiate some things. At a certain point, some military operations have to be secret to work. But, you know, we're talking about a tenth of a percent as compared to everything that is, in fact, uh, being declared secret. What they're trying to cover up is the wars, the killings, the drug experimentation, and the corruption. There's another bizarre development that seems to be taking place with the CIA under the Reagan administration that I think involves a tremendous expansion of CIA operations and a sort of new field for the CIA to get involved in, and that's the use of businessmen and the Department of Commerce as potential agents. When the Max Hugel affair took place early in the Reagan administration, where this corrupt politician, businessman, friend of Reagan's was put in a position of high power in the CIA, and it turns out that he had all kinds of corrupt business backgrounds and connections. It came out on ABC's Nightline, the Ted Koppel show, in an interview with Bobby Inman, who's deputy director mm -hmm. of the CIA, that the reason Max Hugel was brought into the White House was that he had a lot of businessman connections mm -hmm. that they would be able to use for operations abroad. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this? Is this a significantly new field for the CIA to be involved in? We knew, know that they've used politicians and diplomats abroad. They've used military abroad. They've even used journalists that's been revealed. But well, it's by no means new, but, mm -hmm. but we're talking about a degree. They've done it many, many times, and they've done favors for people all over the world gathering information for them, you know, a little favor, yes, we'll find out this for you, whatnot. But it's a question of degree. And in the, in the last few years, including before I got out, there was the government, the U.S. government was crying for more economic information. And during a lot of the years that I was in, we were not, you know, we would get economic information and pass it on to the ambassador to stop him in the hall and say, hey, I heard such and so a deal is going down or something. But what's happening now is your microphone. Yes, my microphone is falling off. <laughs> the CIA arranged that, I'm sure, John. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening now is th this corruption that I'm talking about, where, where a political uh, party, uh, a, a White House administration, is salting people into top positions in the agency because of their business connections mm -hmm. with the intent of using the organization and its resources to gather intelligence to help the people who are, who are sponsoring that party. This is, of course, the heaviest form of corruption. That position that Hugh Bell was in was Deputy Director of Operations. Now, this is the focal point, the commanding officer of worldwide clandestine operations. Now, you think of the sensitivity and the complexity of covert operations in 150 countries, and uh, this is a job that has to be a pro, and a brilliant pro, and one with driving energy. Uh, it, in any sense of the word. Now, mind you, I, I think that we would probably be better off if the like job didn't exist. Right. <laughs> but, but there's no way it can function mm -hmm. with a political appointee in there. Right. And as a matter of fact, there was the, uh, part of the reason he was withdrawn was because uh, he, he was shooting himself in the foot <laughs> repeatedly several times. There was an incident about uh, Libya, and he was, you know, in this effort to get the CI moving again, he was approving some, some exceedingly dangerous operations. Assassinating Gaddafi, according to a Newsweek story. He was proposing to assassinate Gaddafi, and there, to my relief, now the Senate Supervisory, the Oversight Committee, which has never succeeded in overseeing the CIA very much, never tried very much, mostly they're encouraging them to go out and do, they did scream at that one and stop him, and it was shortly thereafter that Hugh Gell was was removed from office. Now we have the other one at the top. William Casey is another businessman mm -hmm. with all kinds of conflicts of interest. He's still holding the portfolio on his own business interests, plus all of his contacts. And he's running the whole intelligence organization right now. And he, again, <laughs> like the other one, he's shooting himself in the foot about once a week. And uh, late, l lately, two days ago, he testified to the Senate and uh, about the freedom of information operation. Uh, uh, and uh, he, he was uh, claiming that the CIA couldn't function because they had, they had had so many agents wouldn't work with us, but also so many people resigned because of this uh, FOIA. And when the, the committee, of course, didn't just take his word for it, they said, give us documentation. 
and he couldn't produce any documentation. And finally, he had to admit that not one person had been fired because of, or resigned because of the FOIA. So once again, if... John, you were talking about complexity and the Byzantine nature of some of the operations that go on in the, in the CIA. Here is one really mind-blowing thing, which was in the August 81 Inquiry, the Libertarian uh, magazine. It talks about an incredible thing. It talks about, first of all, a Florida-based worldwide finance corporation. That's, that's its name. It's a financial conglomerate. And after there were some complaints that led to the doorstep of this thing, a local district attorney started investigating it. There were congressional investigations, and the Justice Department started getting into it. And they found that CIA was involved, Cuban exiles were involved, which isn't really all that unusual because they've been involved uh, for decades down there in the uh, Miami area, particularly Gay, the, 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 in their operations against uh, Fidel Castro. Assassination of a president. Right. right. But this also gets involved with drug trafficking. And uh, even further than that, they've found that there are relationships with the Russian KGB and the CIA operating together, exchanging information. They found that there, is re there have been relationships with Castro's intelligence and the CIA, in which the CIA and Castro decided that they would permit the drug trafficking and helping it along, and then share the, the help in sharing in the profits so they could, uh, so they could mm -hmm. finance each other's operations. And it, the investigations, well, they kind of, it became so complex that the investigations not only kind of collapsed because they couldn't figure out what the heck was happening, they couldn't unravel it, but also the CIA stepped in and put the kibosh on it. And even the FBI was frustrated because they were involved in it too. Uh, this seems like something which you couldn't even dream up if you had a wild imagination we were on some kind of drug trip. Does this sound uh, unreasonable? No. You know, li real life is often stranger than fiction. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've already run into this in the, the three books that I've written with uh, trying to write scenes as exactly as they happened. And then your editors scream at you and, and you say, but, but I was there. And that's exactly the way it happened. And they, they finally say, well, nobody would believe it in print. <laughs> but yes, I'm, I'm quite sure that's, that could happen. Uh, I don't know anything about that organization. I haven't followed it. But all of that could easily happen. Well, the one part of it really s sounds true, and that's the permission and expediting of the narcotic traffic for the Cuban exiles so that they can help finance their operations. This sounds very much like what was going on in Vietnam, Southeast Asia. Sounds like a dream business to get into because you would be able to do favors for the CIA, the FBI, the KGB, <laughs> the anti-Castro uh, groups in Florida, and uh, the and Castro himself, and the drug runners. So you would have all of these organizations paying you off and giving you protection. And uh, that sounds like if, if, you were, if you were into corruption and crime, it would be a dream organization. Well, there was drug trafficking by the CIA in, during the Vietnam War. Yes, Vietnam that's Asia. been documented uh, in a, a book, book has been written Politics of Heroin in Southeast right. Asia, with, with uh, documents, I mean documented with government documents they got that uh, conclusively proved and stated that the CIA was... Uh, uh, the way it started is they were working with mountain yards who had, uh, up in Thailand mostly, but also in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, who had made their living traditionally by growing heroin and shipping it out. And uh, so they had, the CIA had its air forces flying planes back and forth, and the mountain yard allies would be flying down to the capital, and they would want to get on the planes with these suitcases full of heroin. And the CIA, you know, some CIA officers were trying to kick them off, but, you know, these were your allies. You needed them. So the CIA was making decisions to let them ride. And then it got to the point where, uh, and by that I'm making, making decisions up the chain of command, then it got to the point where they were actually flying special flights, DC-3 flights, to carry the, the heroin down to the capital as favors for the allies and also to sort of help finance the whole operation. And then it got to the point where, of course, some of the CIA officers involved were finding ways to use CIA vehicles to fly the stuff back to the States and market it.
that's documented. John, now, uh, the last leg of that was not, to my knowledge, approved by Washington. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the Maverick, but the rest of it was approved by Washington. There's another surprising story that came out in the latest Covert Action Information Bulletin, and that is that shortly before his death, Anwar Sadat admitted that Egypt was the conduit for CIA funds to create problems in Afghanistan to aid the rebels so that the United States was involved early on in the Reagan administration with actually uh, fostering the Afghan rebellion. Have you heard any stories of this nature? Of Only what I've read in the press. And, uh, you know, this gets, to, this to me, gets into some of the ultimate cynicism. At the same time, one of the more complex decisions of people in the intelligence world is you have the Soviets in Afghanistan and it's our national politi policy to regret their presence there. You have rebels who are fighting them, and obviously if they had more arms, they would fight better. But there isn't any chance of our giving them enough support that they could win or even get some momentum going against the Soviets. So we trickle some arms into them so they can escalate the, flight, the fighting with the result that a lot more people are killed and their hopes are raised and they think they're, in some cases, they're flat told. Of course, the worst case in history of this being done was where the CIA had a huge program to encourage the Hungarian uprising. And they succeeded. The country erupted in a massive uprising. And then when the Soviets put their tanks in, the United States jumped, you know, back across the ocean and got our hands off the place, and the Hungarians, 20,000 Hungarians died. Well, it happened with the Kurds. Yeah, it happened with the Kurds. The Kurds are similar. The in Kurds, northern yes. Iran. Yes, many thousands of Kurds died identical. When we had satisfied the Shah's little pressure policy initiative against Iraq, and the Shah said, okay, I've got my agreement with Iraq, we jumped back and withdrew our aid from the Kurds, and the Iraqis retaliated and wiped them out. There's also a report here about biological warfare in Cuba that certain mosquitoes were introduced, the Cubans claim, by the CIA that re resulted in fever, malaria of all sorts. Have you heard anything about that story? Yes, the dinghy fever. I've certainly heard about it. I've seen the written stories about it. Uh, I've talked to people about it. The, the U.S. health, the U.S. medical authorities line is that it's not technically possible to introduce uh, fever or fever-ridden mosquitoes into Cuba, which is, of course, nonsense. Um, the difficult thing about that is that uh, there's an epidemic of fever in Cuba. The Cubans claim the CIA was behind it. Uh, it, it the Cubans could be making it up. They could believe it and be saying it. Uh, or it could be completely true. The point, though, is that our government, our CIA, has been guilty of so many things just as nasty as that over the past 30 years that it's absolutely impossible to, to deny it. Plus the fact that they carried out experiments just on this type of thing. They exactly. released uh, millions of mosquitoes over at Charleston, South Carolina to uh, just to observe what would happen. And then apparently it's possible that they put this into effect in Cuba. Although at that, I understand their main, their main target would have been for the Soviet Union. Well, they're preparing for the biological warfare wherever. You know, in our concern with nuclear warfare, and I am very concerned with all these atom bombs that we have, and they have, and the macho people, some of them not very bright, uh, beating themselves on the, you know, the chest and, and talking, but the chemical and biological bombs that are being amassed may be a hundred times as lethal and dangerous and threatening to life on, the, on, on Earth than, than the nuclear bombs. Well, the Nazis foresaw this. Rather than put their technology into a nuclear atomic bomb program, they had these chemical warfare. You remember the CIA the had... Uh, had been, it had been revealed that they had some uh, poison they were, and, and the President Nixon had ordered them to get rid of it right. and then they didn't get rid of it and, Pres and uh, Director Colby was called up to explain why they hadn't obeyed a specific presidential order and it, with his incredible talent for disarming the Senate he said, after all, gentlemen, we're not talking about a big warehouse he said, we're talking about something this size and he held up a little vial it was enough poison to kill everyone in a city of 50,000. 
he held up a little vial this big. He said it was sitting in the back of a safe. And, uh, you know, when you think about that and when you think that there are warehouses of that poison alone, not to mention the disease and germs and things that can blow this way and that, uh, the wor and, and there isn't the, the publicity or the public attention on the, the, the ABC uh, arsenals that are being stockpiled. John, another event we wanted you to comment on, since this is part of your past experience in South Africa or Angola, has to do with the invasion by South African troops in Angola on the pretext that Angola is supporting Namibian rebels and that South Africa has to clean up the operations there and there's Soviet and Cuban troops there that are a threat to South Africa. Could, would you comment on that? What's the current status? Has South Africa been continuing to harass mm. Angola? Several months back we reported in detail on what it's we It's my had. understanding that South Africa has sort of a permanent uh, military force inside Angola. I don't mean they've, they've built camps, but they are there bombing, raiding, dropping people in uh, uh, on, a, on a permanent basis regularly, several hundred miles up inside Angola. What you have in terms of the validity of their claims, you know, Africa was, was when it was broken into colonies that became countries, they were done without any reference whatsoever to the, 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 tr the existing tribes or ethnic groupings. So that in Angola, for example, you have on the north, you have the Bakongo as a large original tribe that now overlaps in three c countries. And uh, in the north uh, east, you have the Balunda, who, who overlap Angola and into Zaire. And in the south, you have the people who are the, the Namibians, or, or the, the people who are uh, of the ethnic grouping with the people in southwest Africa, but half of the people live inside Angola. Now, it goes without saying that these people, with their ethnic link to those people, are going to be sympathetic and there's going to be support and there's mm -hmm. going to be traveling back and forth across the border. Uh, but what you get into is, of course, the modern uh, law. What is South Africa's right to go up and, and bomb and strafe? South Africa's position, of course, is, is uh, it's an outlaw position on Southwest Africa. They're simply refusing to, to give it its own freedom, its own elections. Which if, was mandated by the United Nations. A long years ago, and they've just absolutely refused to cooperate with this. And, and to date, no, no pressure has been brought on them that would really encourage them to, to set Namibia free, to give it its free election. Is there any evidence of CIA complicity in this? Frank wanted to ask about the Seychelles Islands. Some of these might be connected. Well, the, there was a coup attempt uh, in the Seychelles Islands <clears throat> in which a rugby team, supposedly rugby team, uh, came into uh, the Seychelles Islands, into the airport. And there were also some people that, were, that came in earlier in hotels, and they tried to overthrow the government. They had uh, weapons with them. And later it was determined that they, their base of operations was South Africa. As a matter of fact, they took over an airplane and returned to South Africa. Uh, from what you're reading of this is, is there, was there CIA complicity and money involved in that? Or are the South Africans just becoming like a new CIA and doing their well, own mischief? Or well, is it also connected? In, to, uh, in, in, all, in, in all fairness, and to state the obvious, the CIA is not the only agent of mischief in the world. <laughs> and uh, there are many other agents of mischief. Uh, the CIA is working with many of the others as they do, uh, as they commit their crimes. I have, as far as is there any documentation, I wouldn't have the faintest idea. All I know is what I've read in the papers. Uh, so you have to speculate. They obviously had at least an atmosphere of encouragement uh, in South Africa, including in the South African government. When they, they uh, skyjacked the plane and flew back to South Africa, five of them were arrested and the rest were just turned free immediately. And these five were flown off in a helicopter to someone's estate after posting a minimal bond. Then, because of international pressure, South Africa did go back and arrest 30 more. Uh, it's not clear yet what they're going to succeed in and uh, what they're going to try them for. Or, or, or if they will, in fact, convict them. But uh, I, I could easily see something like that as more likely mm -hmm.
developing from uh, South Africans with their very aggressive attitude towards the Seychelles, possibly with CIA foreknowledge, but quite possibly without the CIA knowing about it ahead of time. Had the CIA known about it ahead of time, I'm, I'm reasonably sure they would not have complained or protested. That wouldn't be in their nature. Mm -hmm. But I see no reason to, to, to suggest that they set it up. On the other hand, it's quite possible it's the sort of thing that the CIA uh, station chief might very well do, having dinner or going to the office of uh, the boss chief, I think they call it something else now, the South African Security Force, and saying, you know, what, you, you know, you, you big talk. What are you, you going to do about the Seychelles? Why don't you fly some people up there and take the place and turn it in the right direction? And then the, the South African calling in a couple of uh, rugby players or former mercenaries and saying, you know, it would be easy. Here's what you would have to do. And uh, giving them some advice and guiding and setting it in motion, maybe some money. Right. I might note to our audience that it's quite remarkable that John Stockwell in the last few years has begun this second career as a novelist. As you might know, it's very difficult to get a book published, much less a novel these days. And John's first novel was immediately picked up by William Morrow, which is one of the best New York publishers and has just come out. So we congratulate you, John, on your new career and wish you all the best. But we still want you to come back and talk to us about the CIA and many other things. On well, alternative views. Remember, I'm the last whistleblower. <laughs> I'll never be I'll never be dated. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since we videotaped our interview with John Stockwell on recent CIA activities, a conference has taken place in the Boston area on reviving the CIA. Over a 10-day period, more than 1,000 people attended, and quite a few scholars and anti-CIA activists provided an update on CIA activity. There were two reports in that conference that we didn't touch on in our discussion with John. First of all, Saul Landau of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., reported that he had information that the Reagan administration had notified Congress in mid-December that the CIA was coordinating border raids from Honduras Honduras into Nicaragua and was also using a clandestine radio station to send false rumors to the Mosquito Indians in eastern Nicaragua that the Sandinistas intended to exterminate them in an attempt to get these Indians to have an uprising against the Nicaraguan government. There was also a report in the conference by a Vietnamese scholar, No Vin Long, that during the CIA operations in Vietnam, they recruited agents who are still active in Vietnam, carrying on CIA operations against the Vietnamese people, and also indicated that certain right-wing Vietnamese are now being paid by the CIA to spy on the Vietnamese who have come to settle in this country, and that in some cases, certain of these right-wing Vietnamese have taken retaliatory actions against left-wing members of the Vietnamese community living in America, indicating that there are still Vietnamese intelligent agents and politics going on in this country. Now we jump from 1981 to 1986. Well, 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 guess what? It looks like old Dan Elov might have been doing some business with the CIA after all. Of course, not admitted until he got back into the United States and then not even publicized much in, by the regular media. But it seems that two days after Danilov left the Soviet Union, the U.S. officials changed their story about his contacts with the CIA back in 1985. So it raises some questions about how innocent the man was. Maybe he was, was innocent, but maybe he was just used. Well, we'll see. Uh, Danilov confirmed some of these allegations himself at an October 13th issue of news, U.S. News and World Report where he said he was approached by a father, Roman, who is a, who is supposedly a priest, and he was sought out by him and, to, and was given some information. Well, Long Island newspaper Newsday correspondent Roy Gutman made an investigation into this, and he reported that this father, Roman, promised to give Danilov uh, some material on religious subjects. And he asked uh, Danilov to uh, take the material to the U.S. Embassy, which Danilov did. But there were some other envelopes, including one addressed to CIA Director William Casey, and that was given to the CIA station chief. 
all from this one package from Father Roman. Now, in one letter was a reference to rockets and other military subjects, according to the uh, Newsday Washington reporter. And one embassy asked Daniloff how to get in touch with Roman, and he provided information on how to do it. So in a very unusual uh, move, and one administration official is very amateurish, a CIA man actually called this Father Roman on the phone and uh, said, yeah, we got the packet. And uh, then he later sent Roman a note uh, saying that uh, he had received the package from the journalist friend, just, re just confirming his telephone conversation. So as a result of all these events, the U.S. was eager to have Danilov uh, uh, freed because of the CIA mishandling of this whole business. So it's a question whether Danilov was really involved himself or whether he was just inadvertently used, but nonetheless. Well, what's the final analysis? Helen Re Ellen Ray, who uh, contributes a lot to the Covert Action Information Bulletin and is a co-director of the Institute for Media Analysis, said in answer to the question was, um, Danilov spying. He said, well, he admits to delivering documents to the embassy, discussing them with CIA agents, and giving them information about the man who gave them to him, which the CIA then used to contact the man. And she said, you don't have to be on the CIA's payroll to commit espionage. <laughs> and it might at least have led the Soviet Union to believe that Danilov was a spy. And who knows, maybe the guy was a set up by the KGB. Right. Uh, and indeed, a faction of the KGB that was opposed to Gorbachev's summit with the U.S. This is all lost in murky U.S.-Soviet relations. But what's most striking to me about the Danilov Zakharov affair is that the U.S. media almost unanimously assumed that Danilov was an innocent journalist who is either set up by the CIA or a victim of CIA of rather KGB repression, whereas Zakharov was supposedly a Soviet spy who was caught red handed and was guilty without any question at all. Well, an article in October 1st in these times raises some question about this and indicates that the Zakharov case has all the earmarks of an FBI sting parallel to the Abscam case where the FBI stung certain congressmen by tempting them with certain lucrative payoffs from different supposed Arabs who are really FBI agents in disguise. Well, to put the Zakharov case in perspective in these times, argues, you have to go back to the early days of the Reagan administration when Gene Kirkpatrick was the head of the U.S. delegation to the United Nations and was claiming that the U.N. was a hotbed of third world radicalism and that the U.N. was a <laughs> nest of Soviet spies. The problem was that Gene Kirkpatrick didn't have any evidence that any Soviet UN officials were actually engaged in espionage for the Soviet Union and were therefore looking very closely at the Soviet UN employees to see if they could find some evidence of any kind of spying for the Soviet Union whatsoever. The story then jumps to 1983 when a computer major at Queens College got a call from a UN official asking him if he would do some work accessing some data networks for him to get some information on technology and military affairs. The computer major John had put up an advertisement saying that he was willing to do database searches for people and Zakharov had seen the advertisement and contacted him and then supposedly John went to the FBI and said that he was approached by a Soviet agent or a Soviet UN official who was going to ask him to do some computer searches and from thereafter the FBI was monitoring this situation very closely. What Zakharov was doing at this time from 1983 to 1985 was perfectly legal. He was at that time in the UN Center for Science and Technology where he was responsible for collecting and appraising information on scientific developments to give to third world countries so it was logical that he would look for some some database searches. In, 18, in 1985, however, John was given a job with a Queen's firm that was engaged in manufacture of unclassified precision parts for military equipment. It was suggested in this In These Times article that John might have been given this job to try to set up 
Zakharov to tempt him with some military information and thus be able to arrest him as a spy. And now it's not clear who to believe. Zakharov admitted that he'd worked with John for a couple of years and said that he continued to get information from John from this uh, military uh, uh, company that he worked for in Queens, but claimed that this was all unclassified data. John, however, and the FBI confirms this, claims that Zakharov offered to do a 10-year contract with John to pay him for unclassified military information. And it was at this point that he was arrested and was accused of being a spy. And then, of course, a week later, or shortly thereafter, the Soviets pinched uh, Danilov. In any case, the question is, why would the U.S. arrest ben Zakharov in any case, since he, there was no information that he had anything that was of value, any military secrets, and this became a major media blitz against the Soviet Union and imperiled the summit. The hypothesis of the In These Times reporter is that there might have been people in the Reagan administration who were trying to sabotage the summit between Reagan and Gorbachev, and this was one way to do it. It might have been even more complex than that. I think it was in The Nation. Um, I forgot to bring that article with me, but there was a, uh, a, a reporter analysis of it speculating on perhaps it might have been the Danilov affair set up by the KGB or the military industrial complex of the, of the Soviet Union itself, because we know the Soviet Union is not a monolith and there are hawks in the, within the Politburo and the, et cetera, uh, who would not like to see all these great reductions in armaments that, uh, that uh, the secretary is wanting to, to uh, offer. So it could be that they set up uh, Danilov knowing that the United States would take the bait and create a lot of hate and discontent, and then they wouldn't be able to get this uh, agreement. And so the hawks in the Soviet Union won, as well as in the United States. Right. Yeah, and what's striking is the way that the media in the United States just presumed that Danilov was innocent and Zakharov was guilty and didn't do any in-depth investigation of either of these fellows, or they didn't release any of the information that quest that cast shadows on the official report in the left-wing newspapers. You didn't see any of this in Time, Newsweek, the networks, or any of the major newspapers. That's why you got to read the alternative, alternative press, press in order to find out what's happening. That's alternative views for this evening. We'd like to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV, for the use of their equipment. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713.